Ant2.tv presents You and Your Doctor, teaching you to live a longer and healthier life. Proudly sponsored by All County Healthcare, where people are the heart of our business. All County Healthcare is a Medicare certified agency where one call will service all your home care health needs. For more information, call 954 717 7027 or visit our website, allcountyhealthcare.com. Now, Let's get informed to living a longer and healthier life. Here is your host for today's show. Hey, welcome to You and Your Doctor. I'm Debbie Weiss, filling in for Lorena Anderson. And I want to let you know, tonight's show is brought to you by Amp2 TV Productions. And our sponsor is All County Healthcare for all of your healthcare needs. You can listen to us on 1470 AM and 93.5 FM. Or live stream us on the All County Healthcare um, Facebook page. Give us a call with your questions and concerns at 888-565-1470. Today we have two amazing guests f- joining us, and our first guest is mm-hmm. Jody Glazer. Let me uh, introduce you, Jody. Okay. You're a managing director from the Senior Care Authority mm-hmm. Company. And um, what exactly does Senior Care do, Jody? Uh, Senior Care Authority is a network of advisors. Uh, from around the country, and we help people find the best places for their loved ones to live, whether that be um, any kind of long-term care, assisted living, independent living, memory, small care homes, or um, in-home care. So, Jody, that's a really important function that you that you do. Um, we, you know, we need people to help us do those kinds of things. Mm-hmm. It's a it's a big thing out there in healthcare nowadays, and it's um, it's like an abyss. Mm -hmm. Nobody really knows what to do with that. So I know that you didn't originally start in this type of of an industry. Mm -hmm. How did you do that? And and where did your passion come from? Well, um, I was in corporate America for about 20 years. And uh, really what I did was I helped people to find the right type of training that they needed for it in technology. And so really what I do now is I I do the same thing, but... (laughs) in a different way. So you're always a people person. I've always been a people person, and um, I really enjoy helping people. And basically what I do is educate people in a very important time where they need to make important decisions, and so I'm here for them to help them make the right decisions. Well, that's great. You know, um, I and I, my bet is since it's called Senior Care Authority, you work mostly mostly with seniors. Do you work directly with the seniors, or do you work with their families? Can you give me a little more information on that? Sure. So I work with both. I'm, I work with some people that um, here right now I'm actually working with um, two ladies, um, and they both live on their own, and uh, they're in their 80s now, and they're not as comfortable living alone. So I'm helping them find independent living. Um, neither of them can drive, and so I'm able to go ahead and learn about them, what their likes are, what financially they can actually afford, uh, what's important to them, and then I can go ahead and choose maybe three places is what I'm doing right now, and then I'm going to bring them on tours, and I'm going to be there as their advocate. So, so Jody, you, you talk about all these different things, and I noticed that you said these ladies can't drive. That must be really stressful for them having to find a facility yeah. or a independent living mm-hmm. that meets their needs. Yes. Tell me a little bit about how you know how you go about doing your research and mm-hmm. what some of the th- things are that you look in, into the facilities to find out the quality mm-hmm. of them. What, is, or is it just a gut call? <laughs> um, it's more than that. So um, uh, Senior Care Authority, none of the advisors will go ahead and take anybody to a place that they haven't already been to. So that's really important. I also check out citations. Um, to make sure that they're in a normal range. And I learn about um, what kind of offerings they have, what kind of people they take care of as far as health concerns are con- are concerned. And some places have a lot of activities and people are really outgoing. And other people are really more introverted. They want something quiet. Maybe they're sicker and they don't really want to be somewhere where there are a lot of, a lot, there's a lot going on. So I can kind of gauge from there. I also learn about the financial needs of my clients, and then based on all of that, I'll go ahead and choose maybe three places. So so let's talk a little bit about different people's personalities and different people's needs, because it sounds like you really do a lot of work for each 
each of your clients. Mm -hmm. um, but the one thing that got me a little worried there, I heard you say the word citation. So are you talking about like mm -hmm. tickets? Because I mean, to me, a citation might be something that you get mm -hmm. when you, you know, you, you run a stop sign right. or something yeah. like that. So, so you do the background work to find yes. out if the facilities have had any things go any incidents or any yes. problems mm -hmm. so the state of florida and i um everybody every state is different but in the state of florida um i can actually go ahead and find out what kind of citations or what kind of issues that that facility has had because it's all recorded um and there are different levels some are not really a big deal some may be a little paperwork that wasn't done right but some could be very very um important and dangerous so um i know how to read those citations and figure out if it's a place that I would even really want to take people. Did you have to have any special training um, or what to, to become a senior care authority person? Mm -hmm. Did you have to go back to school? Did you get a certificate? Mm -hmm. um, well, I, I joined a franchise, Senior Care Authority, and there was um, quite a bit of training that I went through with them a few months. Plus, we have training on an ongoing basis, so I have them there behind me. I did also want to mention you were talking sure. about the citations. Um, we also have in Florida the ombudsmen, which are um, people who want to go ahead and complain about issues that happened in any of these facilities. We'll go to the ombudsman and they'll go out and check and make sure that things are okay or not okay and it's all reported too. And so um, when I check for people, I, I talk to the ombudsman as well as look at the citation. So I'm very careful. So you have a personal relationship with people. I do. It's not just with your clients. You have personal relationships with the with the care with the places that you go mm -hmm. to you've you've learned about them mm -hmm. you you you've met some of the people right. there right do mm -hmm. you do you go through do you get to meet the staff and see some of the different activities mm -hmm. that they offer oh, yeah. tell us about some of the activities they offer well so uh, people don't realize how much fun assisted living can actually be so a lot of people have an idea of what the old nursing home was and that they're very drab their people just are withering away Assisted living today is much different. They have all sorts of great activities, arts and crafts. They have um, different uh, people that come in that do um, different kind of speaking engagements. They have music that comes in. Um, they'll actually go ahead and go out and do field trips. There are different parties and events. So it can be really a lot of fun and very stimulating. Almost like summer camp, it sounds like to me. It's I mean, it sounds like, a, like something yeah. you could go there and just like enjoy every day, which isn't mm -hmm. that what retirement's all about? Absolutely. It's really a better way of life, and it makes your life a lot easier. Also, a lot of these places, or most of them, they offer meals, two or three meals a day. Uh, plus, they'll go ahead and clean your apartment for you. So it's someplace when I look around, I'm looking at where am I going to move to when I get older. It's, it, they're really very nice. It sounds great. So let me ask you a question. I mean, we're talking about placement facilities, but what if somebody was home and they, they do you help with, with people who are at home? Do you help get them? Maybe they're not ready to move mm -hmm. to that facility. Yes. Do you help them before the transition, with the transition? Do you, um, where are some of the avenues that you fit in besides just looking at a facility for someone? Mm -hmm. Well, all of us from Senior Care Authority, we work locally, so I'm very... Um, in close connection to all of the, uh, or a, a great deal of people that work in the healthcare industry. So if uh, somebody needs something else, like they're not really ready to go um, and move, then maybe having somebody like an in-home caregiver coming into their home, uh, that's something that I can help them with. I can re recommend them, and I, I, I know people, like you said, um, personally. If somebody needs some a financial person or maybe a lawyer or a geriatric doctor. I know there's people that are in my territory, so I'm very comfortable helping people with matching up, matching them up with other needs that they might have. So, do you take your your clients and mm -hmm. create almost a book for them, almost a, a a thing of saying, you know, look, ma'am or sir, when you have a problem, like. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're not feeling great, this is a doctor. You should definitely see a doctor. Don't wait. Or the next thing is, you know, if they need care, um, maybe if they need an aid or mm -hmm. if they need home health care, mm -hmm. you can help put all these things together for them and create an entire, um, almost an entire picture for where they're going to go next or um, how they can live their lives, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, absolutely. And I'm, I'm also, I also work with a lot of people who, Maybe their their family, their mother and father live here in Florida, but they live up north. And so there's issues going on with their mom or dad. They're worried about them. They live in another state. 
mom won't move back to the cold. So I don't blame her. Right? I got to be honest. You know, when I moved to Florida, the first thing I said was, I am so glad to not have to shovel snow. Yeah. So uh, I don't blame anybody for right. not wanting to go back. Yeah, but they want someone here who's an advocate for their parent to make sure that as they go through the steps and make transitions in their life to make themselves more comfortable and safer, um, that somebody like me can be there for them. So you can act as an intermediary and you can take some of the stress off the family because sometimes that's a lot of stress. You know, yes. if you have to fly back and forth, we see it all the time. Um, yes with you know elderly or people who really sound functional on the mm -hmm. phone and then when the child get, the the kids get down mm -hmm. here they're like oh my gosh what's been going on with mom what's right. been going on with dad and and then you can come in and help fill that void and make it easier for them is what you're saying absolutely I, a lot of times people come here during the holidays and then they thought mom or dad was okay but they see there's no food in the house maybe the house is dirty they're not showering their clothes aren't clean um, different things like that that are telltale signs that something's not going right. Maybe bills aren't paid. So somebody like me can come in and help. Um, I'm an advocate, basically, is what I am for people. You know what? I think we all need an advocate, yeah. right? Every day we need Absolutely. somebody. I wish somebody could adv advocate for me sometimes, you know? <laughs> right. Um, but I think that's a great thing, the services that you're providing. And um, I know you said you you really love this. So... Um, I don't know, can you share with me any of like some of your best experiences with this or the things that made you feel so proud and so like wonderful with this, mm -hmm. this company that you're, you're now the managing director of? Uh, yeah, it's, um, it's really a good feeling. I mean, in corporate America, you do a good job and it's great. Here, people really are very thankful and I'm just doing what I said I would do. I'm helping them out and just going th through the process that I explained to them. So, um, yeah, I've worked with people and... I mean, I really haven't had any, everyone seems to be pretty happy with, you know, getting some help, basically, right. just getting some help. So, so talk to me about some of the um, stresses that you see um, and, mm -hmm. and how you might help someone sure. pick the right facility. Like, what, what's something that's really stressful for someone and, and then how do you know this place is right? Right. Well, try and imagine, I mean, if your mom lives here in South Florida and you live in Boston, and uh, you know that she needs to make a move, whether it be independent or assisted. You just know that she's had several falls before. Um, her eyesight might not be very good. And just in general, they might be some aids that are coming in, but you feel like they need some more. So um, somebody like me can come and step in, meet, uh, meet mom, really learn about the needs that she has. Uh, what does she like to do? Uh, um, how does she like to spend her time? What are her issues? Is she, ha is she having memory problems? If that's the case, then there are special places that can help her with memory problems. Um, does she want to be somewhere that there's a lot of activities that are going on? Um, does she want to be somewhere that it's very quiet? So I really learn about that. And like I said, I've been and actually laid eyes on all the places that I'm going to. So I would never take them to a place that I haven't already been to. I think that's that's really important as well. And then Based on what we talk about, I'll help them by choosing a few places that I think are going to fit their needs. And then they're in charge. They're the ones that are deciding what they want to do. I'm just here to help educate them and walk them through, through the process. You know, if you could just imagine trying to find an, another place to live for your mom and you've never been into an assisted living facility before, you have no idea which ones are good, which ones aren't. Um, so you're pretty much blind. And Sounds somebody, pretty scary from this end, yeah. right? And then there's a verbiage and people expect you to understand. They'll talk to you using different acronyms that you've never heard before. So like big medical words or big terms that are from the industry that have big nothing terms from that the people industry. don't understand, yeah. right? right? So give me an example of like maybe a term that somebody wouldn't understand that we could explain to them right here, right sure. now. Sure. Well, activities of daily living is something that people are very worried about. And when they talk about activities of daily living or ADLs, you're like, what is that? Um, and it's just basically the things that we all do in the morning to get ready. So you get out of bed, you go ahead and you shower, you put some clean, clean clothes on, you brush your teeth, brush your hair, and um, go have breakfast. So if you have any problems with getting up, showering, uh, bathing, dressing yourself, or feeding yourself, those are things that are activities of daily, daily We're balancing living. Balancing your checkbook. Well, I guess we don't have che checkbooks anymore, but I suspect some of the people you work with still do, right? Oh yeah, and paying bills, of course. That's 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 basic. But if you're really having problems with even things like you know showering, 
that's really could be a very big danger. You don't want someone to be living on their own without being able to do those things. Sure, they could fall. Mm -hmm. and, and isn't that the one thing that we're all scared of, that all those people are scared of? Yes, falls are the biggest problem with um, as we get older, absolutely. And I know you can't pre prevent everything, but gosh, if we could be there and prevent mm -hmm. anything, that right. would be great. So I can see that that's... Uh, that's a great thing you do. So when do people reach out to you, Jody? Mm -hmm. Well, it, the better, uh, the the earlier the better. Um, so a month before they want to move, a year before they're thinking about it. I know sometimes it doesn't happen that long, but yeah. I mean, how long does it usually take? Mm -hmm. A lot of times people come to me because something has happened mm -hmm. and they have to move. I've had people come to me before and say, I'm thinking about moving, but when did they actually move? After the falls happened after something, you know, has happened that's been dangerous, which is, it is a shame. Um, the earlier the better is, is always good, but, um, you know, I wanted to warn people when they go online to be really careful because um, people look for information online, which is great. However, a lot of places online will ask you for information, and people don't realize what happens. That information is taken by certain companies, and then they pass it around to all these assisted living and independent livings, and then all of a sudden, you or mom starts getting so many phone calls so from what you're saying is it, it's better to do it one-on-one -on -one because you can give the personal attention and i'd imagine that some of these people when they're desperate or concerned might give information out that's valuable like a social security number or something like that and maybe they could get scammed which we don't want to happen well that's that too but the fact that someone even has your phone number and name and that you're looking for assisted living that's scary enough to me i, I find that to be disturbing and when you're getting tons of calls every day so it can make them vulnerable too yeah it's, it's just very uncom uncomfortable and these people don't know anything about them and Sometimes they're, they're suggesting their places that have nothing to do with the ailments that they have because they don't know them personally. So getting in touch with somebody like me from the beginning can really help to make the transition very smooth and, and a lot less stress. Right. I could see the anxiety of somebody mm -hmm. sitting in their house and then every you know hour or so it's bad enough that i get yeah. cold calls it's terrible, you know from right? a Can you robot imagine? i could not imagine yeah. an elderly person being at home receiving calls from all these strangers mm -hmm. and almost feeling violated in yeah. their own home mm -hmm. and the fact that you could be there for them is really a wonderful thing um so what kinds of communication like can you provide like to the to the client oh yeah um or the family member mm -hmm. how do you get your information across do you do it electronically do you do it via phone oh well you can contact me uh my phone number is three oh excuse me five six one three zero three two two four two you can take a look at my website it's um senior care it's www.seniorcare-palmbeachcounty.com you can also email me at jody at seniorcareauthority.com so it's Jody J O D I, right? That's right. Thank at you. SeniorCareAuthority.com. Yeah. Just want to get that right for our listeners mm -hmm. and our viewers, so that they don't spell it wrong. Because yeah. I, I'm not the best speller, but I can tell you, Jody can be spelled a couple different ways, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. Um, so with that being said, that's good. So at least people know how to reach you, because it would be important to be able to get the stress off and and to have somebody else take over something that is so difficult and so stressful. Mm -hmm. And and I for lack of a better word i mean it's i think it's actually frightening at times because it's such a big change i don't know if you agree but i think that if you've lived in the same place for 20 years to change and to move and to go to another facility or to you know even just have to maybe part with something that's been in this on the same same 12 shelf for 20 years is one of the most stressful things i've ever seen mm -hmm. have happen to elderly people mm -hmm. um it, it really is quite devastating and it's overwhelming even if there's nothing in their apartment mm -hmm. um it's almost like a loss yeah. so moving is difficult at any age but when you're older it really can be um a major change in your life so having somebody there like an advisor is really going to be helpful um i know I know the process, plus I know people that will help them move. I know specialists who will help them move from a home into a small apartment, um, selling some of their uh, valuables if they want to or giving it away. Um, like I said, I know... So you can actually help from the really from the beginning oh, yeah. through the entire process. Yes. Now, once you take on a client, Jody. let me ask you a question. How long do you stay with that client after they've been placed? Do you... After, 
I don't want to say place, but yeah. after you found a wonderful, right. you know, place for them to move place to, place for right. them to move to a, 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 an, a you know, an independent mm-hmm. living or an assisted living, right. whatever their needs are. Mm-hmm. How long are you available for them? Do you do you follow them for three months, six months? Do you keep in contact with the family? Does it just depend? Yeah, it just depends. I mean, we also have some other services, elder care services that I offer afterwards. So if somebody lives in another state, I'm able to go ahead and and maybe make periodic visits to their loved one, uh, maybe collect some data from their caregivers to be able to give that back to uh, the family. Um, I don't know if this has happened to you, but I've spoken to my mom and she'll have gone to a doctor and I ask her, you know, how to go and she'll say, it's, it went great. I'm going to see a specialist next mm-hmm. week. And I'm like, well, if it was so great, why are you going to see a specialist? Right. And, you know, what it came down to in our conversation was that she just gets scared and she can't really, she said her her ears, you know, she can't really hear. It sounds muffled and nothing makes sense. So, and I certainly can understand that. So if somebody needs me to be there for their loved one to collect data for them, I can do something like that. Right, because I find that the, the the group of people that you work with, don't want to admit that they've lost something that's part of their independence. They don't want to admit that maybe their hearing isn't so good. So they just say, okay, I got it, it's yes. great. They don't want to admit that their that's vision's right. not so good. Yes. And so they can't read even the note that the doctor gave them, even that's if right. it's that's right. printed. Because now, thank God, doctors are not mm-hmm. handwriting anymore. anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and, they're, and they're printing out their mm-hmm. notes. But still, I find that a, a lot of... The people that you work with Mm -hmm. have these problems and their biggest fear is admitting that they can't do it because they're afraid of losing their independence. And so what you're doing is such a wonderful thing because it helps them maintain their independence. Mm -hmm. That's right. Even though they're moving somewhere else, Mm -hmm. it's great because now if you don't have to worry about breakfast, let's say, Mm -hmm. because it's provided or lunch, then you can just worry about having a good time and the stress of not having... You know, making a mistake in the kitchen or dropping something on the floor and slipping in it and falling. Right. Um, So your service is such a wonderful thing. Now, I know you said these facilities have so many different options. Yes. And I know you told me that there were a couple ladies that that you've worked with that can't drive. Mm -hmm. Do these facilities have transportation? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And where do they take you? What kinds of... Things sure. Do. So, I mean, they have, they'll have. they take you out on doctor's visits if you need to. They'll uh-huh. usually go ahead and go to the grocery store, to Publix, Walmart, so things like that. But then they also actually have uh, field trips where they'll go ahead and take you out on field trips as well. So you can That's, actually go see a show or the movies. So they'll take you to, to eat theater. To dinner. Oh, wow. yeah. Wow. Yeah. That it, sounds like lots of fun. It's, yeah, it's a lot of fun. It really It's is. almost like having an, your own Uber, right? <laughs> <laughs> that you didn't have to call on your phone because you couldn't see it. Right. That's right. That's wonderful. Mm-hmm. That sounds really nice. And, and do you know any of the, some, some of the activities that they even have in these facilities? Oh, yeah. So, I mean, just about anything that you can think of from painting to shows to travel to having people come in from local colleges to talk about uh, the topics of today. So there's really a lot that um, that you can participate in if you wanted to. So you could be busy from from dawn oh, to yeah. dusk, basically. Yeah, like you said, day camp, adult day camp. It could be a lot of fun. That's really, really mm-hmm. great. So so just to remind our listeners, um, first of all, we're, we're sitting here with Jody Glaser, a managing director from mm-hmm. Senior Care Authority. She's great at helping people get from one place to the next, or maybe even just picking up the loose ends that you're not able to do anymore with the client, with the, with the family, um, with anybody that needs to be. If you want to get in touch with Jody, please call her at 561-303-2242. And if you want to email her, email her at Jody, J-O-D-I, <laughs> at SeniorCareAuthority.com. And her website, if you want to get a little more information, is www.SeniorCare-PalmBeachCounty.com. Thank did I get you. that all right? You absolutely did. Thank oh, you. I'm so glad because we were having so much fun, Jody. <laughs> <laughs> so, so tell me something else. How was your day today? My day was good. It was it was interesting. I actually went and met with some geriatric doctors. Nice. And um, uh, I was with uh, one of my friends who works at All County um, Healthcare. We love All County Healthcare. Yeah. You know they they have they are able to f- provide great services for mm-hmm. our for um, our listeners. They mm-hmm. have physical therapists, occupational therapists, mm-hmm. um, home health nursing, aides, 
And um, if you want to get in touch with All County Healthcare, please, by all means, give them a um, shout. Go out to their Facebook webpage. The number I have for them is 888-717-7170. Feel free. Give them a call. Let them know that you're interested. If And I'm sure, Jody, you've worked with lots of home health agencies as well. Mm-hmm. Yes. Right? Mm-hmm. In case somebody's at home and you walk in and you find Absolutely. that they need help and mm-hmm. they're not ready to move on mm-hmm. to the next facility. Mm-hmm. So that's great. Um, let's see. What else? I did want to um, let Tell you know me. I wanted to offer... Um, all of your listeners, uh, a free 30-minute consultation to talk about anything uh, that has to do with having to move their parents or if they're worried about the parents' health and they're not, they're not able to help them. Um, I can definitely have a conversation with you to, to kind of help you get in the so, right, go in the right so direction. Mention that you heard Jody on you and your doctor yes. on either 1470 AM or 95.3 FM, Mm -hmm. and she's going to give you a free 30-minute consult. Look, I don't hear free much (laughs) so often these days, Mm -hmm. so if you guys can get something for free, please give Jody a call because I know she's going to help you out and give you some of the things that you need to have. Mm -hmm. And just letting you know and letting our listeners know, we are going to cut to a break right now, and when we come back, we're going to have Dr. Joe Biasi a urologist to talk about some some great urologic things that are going on these days. <laughs> Thanks, Jody. Oh, thank Hope you. I appreciate you soon. it. Thank you so much. All County Healthcare Inc. is locally owned and operated, serving the Tri County area, Palm Beach, Dade, and Broward counties for the last 25 years. The practice of medicine is changing dramatically. All County Healthcare Inc. still does it the old fashioned way where our nurses and healthcare professionals come into your home to service your medical needs, providing you the fastest and best care possible. For more information, call 954 717 7027. And remember, Medicare Home Care is covered by Part A of Medicare with no out of pocket cost to you. It's your decision and only your decision on what health care agency you use. Call today, All County Home Health Care, Inc. at 954-717-7027. License 200-99096. Getting older is not for sissies. That's what one of my patients says. And it's funny, but it's true. Live long enough and you'll get arthritis, skin cancer, probably one of the common chronic diseases like CHF, COPD, diabetes. At All County Healthcare, we teach you how to manage your disease. We make sure you know how to take your medications and how to recognize signs and symptoms before requiring hospitalization, no matter how many visits it takes. You didn't move to Florida to be sick. You moved here to enjoy the rest of your life. And that's exactly what our team of nurses, therapists, and aides at All County Healthcare help you do. You are listening to You and Your Doctor, Living Longer and Healthier, an informative show that helps you find answers to questions you always wanted to ask but did not have that somebody that could make a difference in your life. Call into the show if you have a question at 888-565-1470, and we will put you on the air to inform all our listeners. Now, back to our show. Hey, we're back. We Welcome back to You and Your Doctor, and I'm Dr. Debbie Weiss, filling in for Lorena Anderson, brought to you today by Amp2 TV Productions and our sponsor, all County Healthcare for all of your home health needs. You can reach them at 1 888 717 7170. You can listen to us on 1470 AM and 93.5 FM and live stream us on All County Healthcare Facebook page. Give us a call with your questions and concerns at 888 565 1470. And now we have Dr. Joe Biazzi. He's a urologist. He trained at Beth Israel, Mount Sinai Urology in New York, and he currently works here in South Florida in Boynton Beach and Delray. Um, today we're going to discuss three different things with, with Dr. Biazzi. We're going to talk about some kidney stones, we're going to talk about PSA, which is always in the news, and of course the ever, the, the ever famous erectile dysfunction, which has been on every commercial that you watch. So first of all, welcome Joe. Thank you so much. Appreciate the opportunity. 
How was your day? Busy, but fun. Good. We're, yeah. we're so glad that you could give us some of the time in your busy day and um, talk to us about a few things. You know, let's talk about kidney stones because it's something that happens to everyone, or not everyone, hopefully, but it happens quite frequently. And how does someone know that they actually might have a kidney stone? What are some of the, the, the complaints that they might come to you with? Kidney stones, especially in Florida, are really, really common. Uh, main reason is we live in a warm climate. People tend to become severely dehydrated, get dehydrated, and next thing you know, urine gets concentrated and you form a stone. How do people know? They get severe pain, uh, they get nauseous, start vomiting, and people go to the emergency room. Lo and behold, they do some x-rays and they have a stone. So, so you mentioned that the that people get pain. Tell me a little bit about where that pain would be. Yeah, typically the pain is in the flank or the back area. Usually, so where's the flank? Like uh, I'm not good. I'm not a okay. cook. I don't. You know, I th hear flank. I think <laughs> of like steak. So, so tell me, <laughs> tell me what you're thinking, Joe. It, it's your back. You know, just below the ribs in the back. Um, you're not too low, but right in this area here, um, and it moves around the front. And patients usually get severe nausea. So sort of vomiting. below the shoulder blade is where you were pointing to, right? Exactly. Everyone thinks that their kidneys are real low, um, mm -hmm. but they're not. They're actually much higher, just below the uh, lowest rib. So up a little higher than usual, that's your flank, and that's where the pain typically starts. So it starts above your belly button, in your back. Exactly. And, uh, and, then it, and does it move? Does it stay there? T typically it moves. We use the term uh, in urology called radiating. So uh -huh. it moves around from the flank comes around the front, okay, and sometimes can even move a bit lower. As the stone moves from the kidney down towards the bladder, the pain also moves from the upper back down to the lower belly. Yeah, so I have a friend who had a kidney stone once, and he said it was almost like giving birth, which I'm not sure how he knew that because he wasn't a girl, but with that being said, how... Um you know, uh, tell me a little bit about this pain. Like, is it is is there a classic kind of pain that a patient would get, yeah. or is it the the classic pain is just sudden onset, severe, um, comes on, and patients usually say it comes in waves. So they might get a couple minutes of relief, then all of a sudden it hits them again. And usually this pain, uh, they can't get comfortable. They they start writhing around, and it's typically the colic, and it's just uh, the kidney colic symptoms are just. Patients are miserable. So colic, uh, I think of my babies, right? So explain to some of our listeners what really colic is. Does that yeah. mean it comes and goes, or what yeah, does that it, mean? It it's typically comes and goes, and uh, it comes in waves, uh, severe, and then sometimes when it goes away, people think, okay, uh, I think I'm out of the woods right now. But then it comes right back again, um, and that's typical colic. Comes in waves, severe, associated with nausea and vomiting. Okay, so you said a lot more people are getting stones than they used to, but let's debunk some of the myths, right? Because there's always a lot of myths out there about medical treatments and care. And so what are some of the, the things that you've heard that are sort of the old wives' tales or things that patients do that maybe really they shouldn't be doing? Yeah, yeah. For many years, people think that the cause of stones is consuming too many dairy products, and that's okay. the, the furthest thing from the truth. I mean, people say, oh, stay away from your cheese and your milk and your yogurt. Uh, that's not true at all. The number one cause of stones is dehydration. And actually, if you restrict dairy products, you're more likely to form stones. Interesting. Okay. And, yeah. and why is that? Right. There's something called oxalate. It's another chemical uh -huh. that's found in foods. It's one of the major components of stones, not just calcium. So if you don't consume enough calcium-containing foods like dairy products, what happens is the oxalate that you consume in your diet gets absorbed, then it gets absorbed and gets flushed through your kidneys. Uh, if you consume a lot of calcium-containing foods, the calcium binds the oxalate. You don't absorb it, and you're less likely to get stones. I feel like I'm in chemistry class right now. But that's, <laughs> that's really interesting. So basically what you're saying is there's a, there's a chemical in the... And tell me if I'm wrong. There's a chemical in dairy products that allows you to get rid of what we would call this bad stuff, this oxalate, and, and or bind to it so that we don't accumulate too much in our bodies. Exactly. Calcium, which is in all dairy products, is beneficial and actually prevents kidney stones. Wonderful. You know, so that's something good to know. So I've always heard, like, I guess when I was little, people always used to say, drink cranberry juice. 
What's what's the myth with that? Or yeah. is that a good thing? Well, the whole thing is patients who have had stones, all right, mm -hmm. they're just told to drink plenty of liquids regardless. Okay. Um, whether it's water, juice, soda, just consume a lot of liquids. The one liquid they should not consume is actually tea, either tea. iced tea or hot tea, and that's because it contains a lot of oxalate. Okay. So a typical stone patient. So back to that big word, oxalate again. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it, it's the bad chemical. That's okay. The, well, the we don't want to call anything bad yeah. because, you know, it's not like yeah. a, but it, it is, yeah. it's it, the one thing that's our, it's our culprit here, huh? Exactly. It's the villain in this it, whole it, thing. It's the villain, and most stone patients down here, they get dehydrated, and they reach for the iced tea to rehydrate themselves, which is, you know, right into forming a stone. So the thing um, to know is, is no iced tea. No iced tea, but plenty of water. So, and the cranberry thing, is that a myth? Is that good? Is that it, bad? It, it, it's not bad. Actu okay. Actually, the best liquid to drink after water is lemonade. Really? And the reason is there's something in lemonade, another fancy chemical called citric acid. Oh, okay. So yeah. I've heard of that. That's yeah. in oranges and things yeah. like citric that. Citric well. acid actually prevents stones. Interesting. So water, water, iced tea, no good. Lemonade, good. Uh, citrus, good. I like that. Yeah. I like that a lot. The, the other so, bad thing so all is, those kids on your block are selling lemonade. You should go spend that yes, fifty cents yeah. and buy yeah. a couple of lemonade. A little prevention. No doubt about it. Yes. <laughs> I love that. Yep. So well, that's kind of interesting. Um, so talk to me a little bit more about some of the ways that people can, if the, if you can't prevent it and it happens, mm -hmm. and now you've got the stone and you're miserable, right? Um, is it important that someone comes see a urologist when they have a stone? Uh, absolutely. Um, treatment for stones depends on the size of the stone and where it is between the kidney and the bladder. Uh, stones come in various sizes. A stone that's five millimeters or less, which is less than a fifth of an inch, is likely to pass. So first treatment option is if it's small enough, give it a chance to pass. Okay. okay? Could so that be painful? can be painful, so we always give our patients pain medicine. Uh, they usually have some nausea. We give them medicine to treat the nausea. We encourage fluids. We encourage staying active, not just staying in bed all day. Activity helps. Gravity helps. Go out, do jumping jacks. Go to the gym. Don't stay home and sleep all day. Um, believe it or not, another remedy. I tell patients, have a, have a beer or two. A beer? Yeah. Beer <laughs> so is a diuretic. So now we have, to, we have to exercise and we have to have beer. Is exercise. That it? So they should run a marathon beers. maybe? Hey, it'll help. Anything to avoid surgery. Anything to avoid uh, surgery. Uh, yeah, I'd imagine surgery uh, might, is the last choice. Yes? Yes. Yeah. And, and surgery, do you have to cut somebody open or are there any special no. procedures no, that we do? Special procedures. So tell now. me about what you do, Jim. Yeah, I mean, most of the time when a stone gets stuck between the kidney and the bladder in that tube, it's sure. called a ureter tube, uh -huh. we can, as an outpatient, go up without cutting, no incision, go up through the urinary channel with a scope and a laser, break up the stone, pull the pieces out. So basically you'd be you'd be going into the urinary system with a with with a scope, which is actually sort of like a flexible tube, almost like a, a mini hose, right? Exactly. Wanna, and and with that you can see. We can see the stone. So you can see the stone and then yeah. you shoot like a little laser beam at it. Exactly. You you put the laser beam. This is in definitely contact. the twentieth century. This is it. It's great stuff. Twenty first century. Yeah. I say. Years ago, thirty years ago, they were you know making big incisions and would be prolonged hospital stays and long recovery. Now it's an outpatient procedure. It probably takes. No more than an hour. And what's the recovery with this? Uh, back to normal routine the following day. That is great. Uh, and you know what? I think modern medicine's like really kind of fun because the fact that now you can have something done and nobody has to cut you open and people don't have to see it. And, and how much pain is there afterwards? Afterwards, a lot less pain than the pain that got them there in the first place. So, so that's good to know. And that's yes. what urologists do, right? That's they take care of kidney stones and... Um, and if somebody has a kidney stone, that's what you recommend. You recommend that they come see you. So, Joe, if somebody wanted to come see you, um, what's your phone number? So our our listeners could get in touch with you, your office number, or your is there a website? Uh, there is a website for the Urology Center of South Florida, uh -huh. located in Boynton Beach. Sure. Our phone number is 561-737-9191. Okay. So that's good. So for our listeners, it's 561 737 91, 91. Yes. Love that. Yeah. So anyway, Joe, let's move on a little bit. Let's talk about PSA. What does PSA stand for? 
Do you well, really public want to know? Sur- I'm not sure, but public pa- service announcement is what I used to think. Patient about. stimulated anxiety. <laughs> oh, there you go. No, is, so, it? is it? No. No. no oh, come on. Let's talk. No. Him. Let's give somebody a new term. Yeah, let's teach it, him. It actually stands for prostate specific antigen. Okay. Which so this is a, something only in men. Yes. Good to know. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> and it's a chemical that's manufactured or made by the prostate. Okay. Uh, under normal circumstances. And we use levels of this PSA to determine if someone might have prostate cancer. So it's basically a screening blood test for prostate cancer. At what age should patients start um, mm-hmm. telling their doctors or should their doctors tell them? I always say the patient should mm-hmm. advocate for themselves. Sure. So at what age should a patient consider saying, hey, doc, mm-hmm. I, I need yeah. that PSA? Yeah. Typically, it's 50. 50. Yeah. 40 if there's a family history of prostate cancer or African-American since they're more likely to develop prostate cancer. So basically, we want our African-American patients to take extra special care of themselves, go to the doctors when they're 40 years old, and say, hey, doc, I need a PSA. 100%. And, and, or if you have a family member who's had any history of prostate cancer. Yes. Okay. And our 50-year-olds otherwise. Perfect. So that's good to know. So what exactly does this test measure? The, Besides the antigen, tell me what it means. Well, the whole purpose of checking the level of PSA is finding out if someone potentially has prostate cancer. PSA has been around since 1986. Uh, It's a good test. It's not a great test. It's getting a little bit of bad press over the last couple years. And the reason is someone can have a high reading and not necessarily have cancer, and someone can have a normal or low reading and actually have cancer. And the reason is uh, there are other non-cancerous causes of having an abnormal PSA test, okay? And the only way to make this distinction, if your PSA is high, is by doing a biopsy. So patients sometimes frown upon having potentially an invasive procedure to find that if they have cancer and there are other causes behind having an abnormal PSA test. So it can be a little confusing. So you really need a specialist to help you sort this out is what you're telling me yeah people shouldn't just say hey my psa is normal and i'm fine so how often should patients get examined by their doctor or possibly even go to a urologist if they're not really sure what to do with this lab value because a psa that's a blood test right it is a blood test so they can just take a little tube of blood out of your arm and send it off you don't have to fast like other blood tests. Well, that's good to know because I like to have my breakfast. (laughs) Yes. Although Uh, I'm not getting one of those, (laughs) am I? (laughs) Hopefully not. Good. But, uh, yeah, it should be done at least once a year along with a prostate exam. Um, You know, a lot of people frown upon doing the prostate exam saying, oh, do the blood test alone. That should give you all your answers. Uh, Furthest thing from the truth because 15% of patients who have normal readings actually can have prostate cancer. So 15%, that doesn't sound like a lot. Should we? Is that a lot in medical terms? Because I know sometimes if I just hear 15%, I don't think it's so important. Explain to me a little bit about, is that number sort of bigger when you're talking about medical problems? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you look at 15% of men 50 and older, uh, that, that comprises quite a number of people. And, you know, 15% of those people who, who might have normal readings potentially have prostate cancer. So for all of our listeners out there, don't take 15% as something small, yeah. right? This isn't like 15% of a dollar yeah. or $10. This yeah. is 15% of your life. Right. So it's really important that you have more than one test, right? Sometimes it's not just one, it's it's a combination. It's the physical exam, it's the PSA, and whatever else your doctor thinks you need depending upon your previous history. Absolutely, especially if you have a family history or if you have any urinary complaints, And again, the whole thing with PSA is you can't base a decision on just one reading. It's not a snapshot. I tell patients this is a motion picture. So get a PSA now. If it's not terribly elevated and you don't want to have a biopsy, well, let's check it again in six months, maybe nine months. Uh, Do a whole series of PSAs and see what happens over time. So keep an eye on it. Absolutely. Right. So don't ever yeah. just let something go by the wayside and say, hey, it may be okay. Just keep an eye on it. And especially, I guess, if you have a family history. Right. Are there any new tests in the horizon? Are there, is there anything new that you know about that's coming out that, that our listeners should be thinking about or asking their doctors about? Yeah. Well, PSA was the original test from 1986. Uh, there's a couple of new tests. There's something called a free PSA test. And the purpose behind this free PSA test is to help your doctor 
make a decision whether you need a biopsy or not because regular PSA can be abnormal if you have cancer, if you have an enlarged prostate, if you have an infection. The only way to make that distinction is by doing a biopsy. Free PSA gives the doctor more information to make the decision whether a biopsy is necessary. Based on the level of the free PSA, the doctor might say, listen, based on your reading, you don't need a biopsy because your PSA abnormality might be related to prostate enlargement or prostate infection. So the free so PSA helps you decide, well, maybe you don't need a biopsy at this moment so in time. So the free PSA sounds like it's a little bit more sensitive. It can give us a little bit more information. So why don't they do that first? Well, the whole thing is free PSA uh -huh. is typically only done when the total PSA, the original PSA, is abnormal. So it's trying to really distinguish what made that abnormality exactly and it's trying to help us to help you as the as the urologist or the family practice doc or your internist figure out what might be going on right to make it the upper limit of normal for the regular PSA has always been four uh -huh. and it's that level between four and ten that represents kind of that gray area so when your PSA is between four and ten it's a great time to get the free PSA done to help your doctor make a decision whether you need a biopsy or not. And is that free PSA covered by insurance? Free PSA is covered by insurance, fortunately. That's, that's good to know because, you know, sometimes these new tests come along and they all sound great and they can do great things for our patients and then we find out that insurance doesn't cover it and people are now scared and yeah. they don't really know what things mean. And I think it's great when new things come along and our doctors have more information and they can give us more information as patients. That's a really wonderful yeah. thing. Insurance companies actually love the free PSA because it might spare the patient a biopsy, which turns out to be... I'm sure the patient be, loves that too, right? They love it. The insurance company loves it because they don't have to end up paying the cost of a biopsy. And, and a biopsy, just for our listeners, is where they take a little piece of tissue, right? Yeah. And then they send that off to the lab? Exactly. It's and an office procedure. It takes about 10 minutes, a little piece of tissue to send off to check to see if there's cancer. Right, and, and then the, in the laboratory, somebody looks at it in a microscope, I guess, and exactly. gives you a better answer. Right. What everything looks down at the nitty-gritty level, right? Right. So, so Joe, be, you know, we have, really, this time has been flying. This is lots of fun. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I always love chatting with you, right? Sure, of course. Um, so let's get on to bigger and better things, I guess, is okay. one would say. Let's All get right. on to erectile dysfunction because, you know, you can't watch TV for 10 minutes without having, you know, the little blue pill come on. I think now they come in like like, like little packets the way your vitamins would come. You're watching. I'm, I'm watching. Yeah, you're watching. I'm watching. I'm <laughs> watching. I'm watching because I have to watch, you know, the Oscars <laughs> and all those fun things. But so tell us a little bit about, um, the one thing about erectile dysfunction I think is great is that it's no longer taboo. Right? No. People used to not want to talk about it. It was a horrible thing. You know, they were embarrassed. Um, the The best thing that's ever happened are all of these commercials and, and the ability for um, anyone out there not to be embarrassed and to go take care of this, the, you know, a situation that might be uncomfortable to them or something that might make them feel, you know, uh, maybe not as masculine as they felt before. Right. Yeah, so, this is... Uh the, uh, dinner table talk nowadays across America. You know, the whole ED thing is, is it's commonplace. I mean, uh, you know, you can hear it anywhere, uh, whether it's in a restaurant, uh, whether it's uh, in a hospital setting, whether it's in a nursing home. People are talking about erectile dysfunction all the time in the treatments. Okay, so um, so let's let's talk about what kind of patients might might develop this and um, what directions or who should they see and and how can they help themselves besides the little pills? Yeah, I mean, there's actually between 15 and 20 million men in the United States who have some degree of erectile dysfunction, and it actually, unfortunately, starts about at age 50. So there's... Everything's fi happening at age, age 50, 50 on the yeah. show. <laughs> Prostate issues, ED issues. Actually, 50% of 50-year-olds start having some issues as far as erectile dysfunction. And then it goes up to about 60% of 60-year-olds, 75% of 70-year-olds, and almost 100% of 80-year-olds wow. having some issues. Wow, wow, yeah. wow. So it's, yeah. it's a, and down here in Florida, 80 is young, right? Yes. So, so I can see that there's a lot of people who are very, you know, this topic is important for. Oh, absolutely. It's a quality of life issue for sure. So, so let's talk about these little pills. Do they really work? And the, the pills 
are very, very effective, starting with the little blue pill, Viagra. Uh, Pfizer's done a great job of promoting their product. Um, very effective drug, a very safe drug, despite everything that people heard years ago when it first came out on the market about right. blindness and uh, hearing loss. Um, Viagra is probably safer than Tylenol. Okay, there are certain people that shouldn't use it. Um, so you have to check with your doctor first, right? Absolutely. Check because I doctor. guess over fifty people can have other medical problems. Sure, sure. You know, um, and and that's something that you can't just run around and. It, yeah, well, can't use your neighbor's Viagra. You shouldn't use your neighbor's. Yeah. You shouldn't you, you use your neighbor's anything, right? What? But but especially their Viagra, <laughs> right. yes. because the consequences could be pretty bad, yeah. right? Yeah, that's why you know a lot of the. Um, uh, bad cases that you heard of people having side effects and dying from using Viagra or typically from patients using uh, medicine that was not prescribed to them but given to their neighbors and the neighbors just said here take this if it doesn't work take more take more and more is not necessarily more better more, more is not better, better. Yes. right when it yeah. comes to prescription medications yeah. you have to follow the label you have to call your physician you can't play around with that stuff right more is not better. Even with Tylenol, more is dangerous. Sure. Um, so talk to me about what's the differences bet between these medications. There's Cialis, there's Levitra, I think. Yes, and, that's right. And, Levitra, uh, Cialis, Viagra. Viagra. No, th they all work pretty much the same way. The whole premise of treating erectile dysfunction is getting better circulation, more blood to the penis, okay? And they all pretty much work the same way. Subtle differences between the three have to do with how long the medicine stays in your system. Take a Viagra pill now, probably will be in your system for about six to eight hours. Levitra, a little bit longer, maybe eight to ten hours. Cialis, advertised as the weekend pill, 24 to 36 hours. Right. I know, they're, they're in those bathtubs or whatever. <laughs> it's amazing it's how clean you can get after you take a Cialis. <laughs> in different <laughs> so, bathtubs, yeah. which I always uh, thought was kind and of Viagra interesting. Viagra makes you the better dancer. Right, so yeah. so the, the uh -huh. you know so they all have their pluses, right? right. But um, so we talked about whether you could take it with your you know with other medications, and that's really something I really want to stress that do not take these drugs by any stretch of the imagination because they do have some side effects yeah, that could absolutely. be very dangerous. Yeah, especially um, patients with cardiac conditions. Okay. If you have a cardiac condition and you use a medication called nitroglycerin on a daily basis you should not take Levitra, Viagra, or Cialis. It, it, it will be fatal. So, okay. so, that, so fatal yeah. means it's yeah. deadly. Yeah, no good. Right. Deadly. Like yes. a car crash, like yeah. a bad car crash. Yeah. So, so you need to check with your cardiologist. I usually tell my patients, hey, listen, if you want to use this, here's the prescription. When you go see your cardiologist next week, say, hey, can I take this medication? Okay, so yeah. it's really important that you yeah. either see your cardiologist, You always, and you should always tell your internist that the medication that you're taking you know, what you've been given from somebody else, right? There should be one captain of the ship that knows all your meds. Exactly. Because if yeah. not, then that could be detrimental yeah. as all yeah. as well. Are there any other treatments if this doesn't work? Yeah, there are. Uh, despite what people hear on the Internet or uh, see advertised, there are actually four other treatments. One other treatment, medicine that you inject into the penis uh, called Trimix, another medication called Muse, is a medicated suppository that you put in the pee hole and increases blood flow. There's something called a vacuum erection device, which is fairly effective. And if all else fails, they can have surgery, have a penile implant put in. Okay, yeah. so so Joe, tonight you've told us a lot of great things. We've talked about kidney stones, we've talked about PSA and prostate cancer, and then of course we finished it up with the ever popular erectile dysfunction. Mm. I don't know how to thank you for coming on to the show and being with us on you and your doctor. Can you just tell us how, um, give, can you tell our listeners one more time how they can get in touch with you? It's the Urology Center of South Florida, 561-737-9191. Or go to Urology Center of South Florida on the internet. Okay, so is that www.urologycenterofsouthflorida.com? Yes. yes. Perfect. So once again, we're with Dr. Joe Biazzi. He's an excellent and well-trained urologist who's down here in South Florida in Boynton Beach. Um, we'd like to thank Amp2 TV Productions who brought this um, show to you. We'd also like to thank our sponsor tonight, um, the All County Healthcare for all of your home health needs. You can reach them at 1 888 
717-717-7170. Um, you've been listening to 1470 AM and 93.5 FM. I don't know how to thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you for letting us share with you a longer and healthier lifestyle. If you have a doctor or are a doctor and wish to be on the show, call Amp2TV at 866-244-5422 and we will put you on the air as soon as possible. Tune in next week for more information on living longer and having a healthier life. The opinions expressed on the preceding sponsored program were strictly those of its hosts, guests, and callers, and not necessarily those